Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm here with Martin Lindstrom. Mark, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on your great show. Yeah, so Martin, I'm uh, really honored to have you on as you and I were just talking before. Uh, I've been, I think I read your first book about 17 years ago. So uh, it's, it's great that we're jumping on here today. Uh, you've really been at the forefront of, of branding and customer experience for the last 20 years. Uh, you've worked and advised with organizations like Lowe's and Burger King, Swiss Airlines, and uh, Majid al Fatim. Um, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm sure you can uh, you can fix my pronunciation on, <laughs> you on that. Very well. Okay, um, but but let's start at the beginning because I really want to to take us back to before you were known, before you were as established as as you are today. What were you doing before you got into the world of of consulting and writing books? I was probably one of the most crazy kids you could imagine because uh, I decided, and I'm not kidding, I decided that I wanted to be a branding expert when I was eight years of age. And uh, I'm born and raised in Denmark. So um, uh, there was no television, television commercials back then on, on television. So I got a pen pal from the US who sent me these VHS uh, videotapes with three hours of recordings of TV commercials. And <laughs> then I would literally sit and watch that endlessly. And when I was uh, reaching the age of 11, um, I was a huge fan of Lego. So I decided to mm. build up my own Lego land in the backyard of my mom and dad's garden. Uh, loved it so much. Was really serious though, that I in fact went to Japan to learn how to cut bonsai trees. Um, it was a sponsorship I got from Sony. Uh, God know how I persuaded those guys to, to do this. Anyway, this Legoland opened after almost a year preparation uh, when I was 12. And mm. um, two people showed up. My mom and my dad, which were really the lowest point of my career, I had to say. <laughs> so um, I went down to the local print office. I persuaded them to sponsor me. And they said, yes. Uh, so two days later, I had 131 visitors in my Legoland. The only this, this, was, this was, was what, in the back of your house? It was, yeah. It was the back of the house and it was very serious. I had real canals uh, built in cement where the ships would basically uh, sail and there would be special techniques making them sail through a, a rubber system on the, in the ground of these canals, which, by the way, I, I stole from Lego, believe it or not. Hmm. So it really was a replica of, of this Legoland. The only problem was that... And that on, on this first day of opening, after this ad went into the paper, and the, um, the owners from Lego uh, showed up, including the lawyers. And they said, it's, it's, it's our brand. I said, no, it's my brand. And they literally wanted to sue me. Now, remember, I was 12 years of age, so it was a bit of a shock. Uh, anyway, they were pretty reasonable folks, uh, so they decided to um, give me a job. <laughs> so I was probably the youngest kid in history working at Lego and later on, um, about a year later, I got Lego as a client. Um, and that really is uh, the history. That's the first day I opened my own advertising agency uh, in the end of, of my age of 12. So were you 13 years old when you had your first client? I was, yeah, I was 12, I think 12 years and, and 11 months old. I was yeah. you know, really focused on the month back then. Right. And yeah, I had Lego later on. Uh, it grew and I sold the agency later on to, uh, to a chain called BBDO. Um, and, was and that really when you were grew. like 15 or? <laughs> was that 33? Thir 23. <laughs> 23. 23. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, I just want to pause there for a moment because, uh, like, I mean, that, that just sounds so fantastical to, to hear that you're not even 13 years old. You've landed your first client. It's a global brand. Of course, there's a story behind it. So, so that part makes sense. But what were you doing for Lego when you're not even 13 years old? Well, this is the interesting part of it because Lego had a, a philosophy and it was to understand the kids uh, extraordinarily well. And mm. they really had the philosophy of why don't we employ our own target group? So I became like this Villa the Bonker chocolate factory thing. Uh, yeah. And I literally had yellow Lego trucks parking up uh, at my mom and dad's house. And, and of course, I don't need to tell you, I had hundreds of friends. So sure. you know, I'd, I'd yeah. zero before, but hundreds of <laughs> this. And, and um, it really worked because Lego taught me how to place myself in the center of, of an organization, seeing the world from a consumer's point of view, which really have stuck with 
me ever since. And, and you would see even today, if you fast forward to, to 2020, that um, my latest book, uh, Small Data, which came out just you know, a couple of years ago, was all about how you live with consumers and see the world from a consumer's point of view, because we've completely forgotten about it. Mm. And that really was something I learned more than 30 years ago uh, through my work with Lego. All right. And so Lego was the first client. How did you go about getting your next client? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I, I when BBDO to go, I worked at a, a large uh, advertising agency group, of course. They're one of the largest in the world. I think they still are. Um, and, and grew within the organization to become um, you know, the Scandinavian head of business development. And, and at that stage uh, in 1994, um, something unusual happened. Um, I'm actually going to Canada now. You're from Vancouver. I'm going to Montreal. And this British man comes up to me uh, just after my presentation. I did a presentation about something called the internet. Uh, remember, that was the year the World Wide Web was invented. Right. And this British man, he says, Martin, I really adore your, uh, your amazing story about the internet. Uh, is there any chance you could write a white paper on that topic? And I had no idea about what a white paper was. Anyway, I jumped on a plane back to Denmark. I still lived in Denmark back then. And uh, on the way back, I'm sitting next to this loud mouth, the American guy. And he's saying, do you know what? I've just been to Australia, to Sydney. And uh, I really, honestly, my only impression of Australia back then was the Sydney Opera House and a kangaroo. Mm. So I started the conversation with this guy while reading this paper, this this paper from this uh, this British guy and I realized uh, that this guy from, a, from, from from Britain was actually Australian and I thought gee this is a sign uh, there's something to do with Australia so I went back to Copenhagen two months later this British guy which I now realized was Australian called me and he says um, is there any chance I could come by and, and visit your office? So I said, sure, come by. Came back. And we sat in this office and he said, so have you made any thoughts about the internet? I said, yeah, I have a thought or two. So I said, do you have a napkin? He said, sure, I have a napkin. He gave me a napkin and I wrote, I, Glenn Williams, hereby employ Martin Lindstrom as of tomorrow. And I signed it and I sent it all to him and he said, oh, what a wonderful idea. And then I moved to Australia. And that really was the first time where I, first of all, jumped to another continent. But on top of that, it was really the first step into the internet and how to, to grow that whole space. So I really transformed my background from being pure branding to become mm -hmm. branding on the net. Later on, wrote a lot of books about it. But that was the first time where I really started to be serious about it, write about it and all that. So just so I want to really understand the timeline here and for everyone. So at 12 and 13, you, you get your first client Lego, uh, your, your ad agency is born, uh, at 23, 10 years or so later, you, you sell that or that's acquired by BBDO. Is that correct? Or did you just kind of, that's right. Okay. No, acquired. Yeah. So acquired. And then you work within BBDO, uh, for, for several years. I worked with them until uh, when I was, I think it was, uh, so that was 1994. So I, my math is right here that I was, when I was 24, that was where the net was invented, or at least the World Wide Web. And I moved uh, shortly thereafter when I was 27 to Australia. Um, and then I started up BBDO Interactive in Asia Pacific, um, mm. which later on uh, grew to become the largest player in, in that region. And so at what point did you decide that you were going to go out on your own again and, and start your own business after being kind of within, you know, the, the corporate world of BBDO? Well, it happened in year 2000. Um, I, I, um, I sat on the board of something called Yellow Pages in the U.S. and I was not founding yellowpages.com, but close to. And we sold that to a company called Pacific Bell. And at that stage, I thought, gee, I have to retire now <laughs> when it was in 2000. And then I just realized that was horrible. Um, mm. well, so, why did you think you had to retire? Is it because you made so much money or because you were tired of, of just I, business or I, politics or I, what? Yeah, politics probably did the, the, the main trick. I really did not understand the concept of politics back then. Now, mm. later on, it became a huge part of my life. Um, but at that stage, politics did a, a, it was really very overwhelming for me. I didn't understand how people could be so irrational in everything they were doing. Mm. So, so what happened was that I, uh, I started to write a lot of books and a lot of people approached me. And they said, hey, do you want to 
consult for us. And um, I was kind of flattered by it. So I started to travel a lot out of Australia um, to the rest of the world. And that really became the foundation of Lindstrom Company and, and the organization we run today, which is all about uh, helping companies to transform their business and their cultures, right? right. And brands, of course. So now you've, you've written seven books. You have an eighth coming out, I believe, if my numbers are, are correct That's here. That's right, yeah. Um, did, were you, like, would you consider yourself well-known or well-established before you started writing books? Or is it really the, no. the books that kind of put no. you on the map? Well, I think for everyone listening in here, um, that if you want to build your personal brand, uh, books were and still is the way to do it because mm. it gives you, it has some benefits which are really powerful. The first one is that um, it's, I tend to say it's the most expensive business card ever, um, right. but it has a lot of credibility. But the second thing it does is it gives you um an ability to fragment or defragmentate your data and your brain. So a little bit like, you know, when you have a lot of data on your computer and you have to defragment it, mm -hmm. it's a little bit the same your memory does. And you may have a lot of interesting thoughts, but you never really combine it as perfect building blocks. Right. Now, uh, when you write a book, you structure these sentences and those building blocks in a very elegant way. So it really helped me to articulate things in a very professional way whenever you're saying something and the mm. book was really helping that to happen so as a consultant you of course have a lot of um have a lot of phrases and methodologies but when you write a book it becomes even more sophisticated so that was really the second thing and i think the third thing it, it helped me to do was to constantly renew my myself because you need to launch a new book all the time and mm -hmm. you need to do that to maintain your brand and it's incredibly difficult to do because you, 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 you tend to fall asleep. You tend to say, well, I'm pretty successful as I am. Why do I have to reinvent myself? So one of the things I learned, and I recommend everyone else to do that, I, I always said, basically from when I was 10 years and 12 years old, I always said, I want to be the best at branding in the world, but I can't really own that space because a lot of other people was a much better than I am at that. But why don't I combine it with another thing? So I always tend to say that creativity is to combine two ordinary things in a new way. So I said, why don't I combine it with the net? Okay, the internet plus branding becomes no online branding. Okay, right. then I took it with children. Branding and internet, or branding and children became brand child, a book of mine. Then I took the senses. Branding and the senses became uh, brand sense a book about how to build brands then i took clicks and mortar two combinations of that and then later on i took neuro and marketing and that became neuromarketing and my book about biology and so i constantly have tried to combine new things around the core space which is branding and guess what when you've done it eight times or seven times at this stage you by default become the expert in the mm -hmm. center which is branding right but it's incredible hard because in the process, you constantly need to ask yourself, can you reinvent what you've been standing for over the last four or, or, or eight years? And I always feel deeply insecure. But once you get used to it, it kind of, you're, you're on this rolling ball. And, and that is, I think, the, the key factor and the key benefit I've had by, mm. by writing books. When, when did you know that you had kind of quote unquote made it or that the book was working for you was it as soon as you published it was it a you know a year or was it even your second book at what stage do you know yeah this book thing is is really working for me um that's a very good question and i do think i i probably realized it when i would go to a foreign country um somewhere out in the world and uh, people w i would see my own picture on billboards and i would have 20 people or 100 people waiting for me in the airport a little bit like a mini celebrity without yeah. any comparison to and anyone. When else. was that, Martin? How, like how many books was that? Book I number probably, three or five or one? Three or? three or four books it started to happen. I, I think one of the strengths of my books is that I'm probably one of the few non Americans who have done well in this space because uh, I know as a, Cam a Canadian, you, I think you know what I mean that. There's sadly very few non-Americans who have done very well on the speaker circuit and writing books with truly global books. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I pushed immediately when I was fairly young was to say my book needs to be published in as many 
languages as possible. So quite often I was discounting my books when we sold it to foreign rights offices around the world. And I think that's one of the reasons why the book is now out in average in 50 languages, 50 different languages in 172 countries. Um, over time, my brand name built. And just to prove my point, uh, my brand name is almost non-existent in, in France. And guess what? My book has never been published in French. Mm. Uh, and it just gives you a good idea about that um, the book is a really good tool to build your local brand. And, and for that sake, remember, when you're building a personal brand, you also increase your the value. That means that your price tag is going up. You can ask for, for pretty high price points mm -hmm. uh, for an hour of consulting or whatever it may be. And, and that has helped me not just to earn the money, what really is for me, probably secondary, I have to say, what's more important for me is that today, that whatever advice I give, it has a true influence in the organization. And the mm. stronger your personal brand is, the more piece of people listen to your advice, sure. and the more you have an influence in the organization and can make a change. And yeah. that for me has really been the, the profound the impact books have given me in my life. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I guess, so, so Martin, the question is, there's a lot of people out there who have published books but haven't seen the level of success that you have. What would you say if you had to identify, you know, one or, or two or maybe even three, um, you know, pieces of advice, uh, maybe it's around distribution or maybe it's around the marketing or partners, like what, what really has made the difference for you? What has contributed to, your, to, to the success that you've had through the books? Um, I think there are probably three things. The first one is that I never repeat stuff which have already been written. And I quite often attach it to a major study which I've conducted specifically mm. for the book. So uh, biology, B-U-Y-ology, which is the largest still today, um, it was written in 2008, still today the largest neuroscience study in the world. I remember reading that said, actually, yeah. It did, okay. Yeah. Well, it, it was, uh, I was almost going bankrupt when I wrote it, I remember I was really a month away from going bankrupt because it was costing $7 million. And I put up a lot of those money myself. Of course, I so what money. was costing $7 million to, to conduct the study? To conduct or? the study, to conduct the study. Yeah. We, we scanned uh, 2000 consumers brains using fMRI. Now fMRI is the most advanced scanning methodology on planet earth mm. and a scan can easily cost three or four thousand dollars so and then we need to have professors and independent teams verifying all of this stuff that was and i had zero knowledge about it when i began wrote, writing that book so you can imagine mm. that, that is really costly and yeah. um, but the study helped to give the book a twist which no one else had and the twist to that book and to hopefully all my books is what i call a counterintuitive twist it is you think you know one thing and you're completely wrong so one of the key conclusions out of biology were that health warnings on cigarette packs had the opposite effect they actually encourage you to smoke more not less um and that was really you know, had a profound impact in particular in Canada, where Canada was the first country in the world to have blank cigarette packs, it's partly spinning out of the work from this book, but also around the world, that study has really pushed people to smoke less. Mm. So the first thing is to do a proprietary studies, which can of, of a solid nature, which can really question the established norms. The, the second thing in the book is not to write it to your colleagues, or to the professors or to people which you aspire to become um, or look up to, but to write it to the ordinary person. Mm -hmm. And then see, I'm, I'm looking down at my readers because I love them to death, but we don't have patience to read those heavy textbooks with graphs and bullet points and all the sure. stuff we read in school. You and I just go blank and we feel we're school kids again. But what we do like is to read books which are both entertaining and mm -hmm. where we learn at the same time. And that's the reason why my writing style is almost written like a novel. In, in, so small data is definitely written like a novel, but it's all true. So you learn while you read this novel of finding small data around the world. Uh, so that's the second thing. The, sec the third thing is really to realize that when you get a publishing house, and by the way, do not self-publish. I, I know I probably will have a lot of enemies saying to me, hey, uh, why do you say that? I say it because even though publishing houses are incredible 
conservative and old fashioned, they do still have a distribution system which uh, you cannot establish with the same credibility mm -hmm. publishing yourself. And, and I say that because if you are going through a publishing house, you're also more likely to be reviewed by New York Times or Wall Street Journal. If you publish yourself, it's almost impossible. Um, but there's another dimension to this. Do not rely on publishing houses to do the marketing for you. Right. Uh, so just to put this into perspective, when I write a book, it takes me about a year, but it probably takes me two years to do the marketing plan. Mm. Uh, so it is incredibly expensive. It's exhausting. Uh, I actually hate it. I love writing the book. I hate to release a book because you always feel you're doing something wrong and you always feel you're a failure, the biggest failure on planet Earth. What are the biggest things that you need to do from a marketing perspective when you launch a book? Like what, what, has the, what have you found has the biggest impact? If you could only choose two things, what would they be? Well, I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, I wish I could give you a formula. I think everyone... Everyone you know or would know of would have been successful with the books have given up figuring out what the formula is. I thought I knew it in 2008 writing mm. biology and then I wrote another book called Brandwashed, which actually was really entertaining and it was a huge flop. And I thought I really cracked the code, right? And I had to rebuild everything from scratch again. So I don't know what it is. I think, mm. I think the key is that you need to understand your audience to an extraordinary degree and get hold of people which are near your audience. So you have this, this influential uh, aspirational dimension playing. Mm -hmm. But, and, and, and the publishing industry has changed a lot over the last four years or five years, because back in the days you would be much more reliant on conventional media. And now it's podcast, it's social right. to 95% of the, the cases. Yet still, there's no formula in even in podcasts. So um, I don't know. <laughs> so Martin, I think I would be remiss if I didn't ask about this $7 million study. Um, what was the monetization plan behind it? I mean, what was going through your mind in terms of the finances and just making that business decision to invest at such a high level? Like, wh where did you see that that would be profitable for you? I didn't, um, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't really, when I'm driven by an idea, there's nothing which really can stop me. I think what well, there is health or something, but, um, when I really believe in something, I go for it and then I don't care about the cost. And of course that is always putting things on the edge. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been so lucky so far that it hasn't in any way, you know, hurt me. Right. But, um, were you self-funding this or did you have sponsors? I was, or? I was self-funding most of it. Actually. Wow. Okay. Um, so what this came from, from the kind of the, the, the fortune that you had accumulated from the past ventures and it, and it did, it did. And it came, Betty, to hard work. It was not like I was a millionaire, billionaire for that sake when I, you know, uh, did my past jobs. But I also went out and did sponsorships, of course, and I approached all the big brands. And mm. um, time after time, they said, no. They said, I don't want to support Frankenstein's. That's what they called it. Um, Frankenstein's back in the days. And no one really knew about neuromarketing by then. It was mm. completely really invented through this concept. Uh, so it was first when the book was released, it really had a profound impact on how companies of a larger size today is, is doing their research. And today I would claim out of the top thousand companies in the world, probably half of them are using neuromarketing in one way or another. So it has, impl no, it has affected companies, but back then, as it is with everything, when it's completely new, people are scared and they want right. to do the conventional stuff. Raising the money was a nightmare. Uh, it was because people backed out all the time. And, and that's the reason why I ended in, in red until I published the book, right? Right. So it appears from the, the surface and the outside that you're doing a fantastic job uh, leveraging your personal brand to grow your business without a big team. Just take us kind of behind the scene for, for a yeah. moment there. You know, what does your, your company and team structure look like? Yeah, well, we, we actually have a pretty large, large team behind the scene these days, uh, which is, I think we're up to 600 freelance people in one way or another, which are helping Lindstrom Company to become what it is today. 600? Uh, the freelance people in one way or another, right? And then we have core people in the core team, which are full-time employed. Um, the way we work, so we work globally. So we operate in more than 30 countries. Um, so I'm in Saudi Arabia today, mm -hmm. where we help women to drive. Um, and, and, uh, but we do these pretty 
crazy projects today. So in the old days, I would help brands um, to survive or sell more. And increasingly in our work, we are changing entire structures in organizations. We basically reshuffle everything. We reinvent entire new concept. We reposition uh, countries, mm. religions. Uh, we reposition people. Um, and we quite often have a twist of sustainability or doing good as part of the underlying agenda for what we do. Um, which is the reason why I'm here with, with women and driving, but uh, it could be anything else from the environment where we basically say to Maersk, the largest shipping company in the world, 21% of all trade is, is ran by them. And where we say, hey, how do we clean up the seas while you have all these ships on the sea? And that became laid on a, a lot of initiatives from, from Maersk, not just because of us, but because of a lot of people in Maersk. And, and I think... Um, uh, in order to make that happen, you need to have a pretty big team and they have to be very specialized. And that team is super specialized. So we have people which are experts in the psychology of taste. So for example, what childhood memories are activated in your brain when you eat a, cho a bar of chocolate? Mm. Uh, that type of level. We, we, we have experts which are experts in the feelings associated with words and how they can combine feelings through combining words and that mm. become names. We have psychologists in terms of colors and the psychology of And, and of these course, are all the freelancers that you bring in? These are kind of like it's freelance a experts? Okay. It's a mixture, yeah. So it depends on how big the projects are. But typically we have a core team of full-time people working on a project, five to 10 people. And then we have, in addition to that, perhaps... 10 or 20 experts coming on board. So within the company, typically like how many, how many full-time people are, are in the company right now? On a company, uh, so on company basis, we will have on any given client, we'll have three to five full-time people assigned per, per client we work with. And we work today with um, probably 15 clients, I think. Something okay, like got that. it. So you might have 50 kind of core full-time people um, Which I'm working on this year. Yeah, and then the hundreds of freelancers that support those projects in all the Absolutely. different ways. Got it. Yeah. So for you as, as kind of the leader of your company, right, you're, you're writing books, you're giving lots of talks, you're all around the world. Just take us inside, like what does a typical day look like for you? How, how do you ensure that you stay really focused, that you're able to be productive with all of that happening, with all the, you know, 30 to 50 uh, full-time people, the hundreds of um, freelancers and, and all the clients? What does your kind of typical day look like? Well, my typical day is probably as unusual as anyone could imagine uh, because I spend most of the time in consumer homes uh, visiting people. So that's what I'm doing here in Saudi Arabia. I'm in Jeddah right now and I'm visiting ordinary people in their homes, living with them uh, to understand how their view of life is. Um, and uh, I do that because I think that if you want to change a corporation or a government or religion, you need to um, truly see things from consumers' point of view back to the Lego story. Mm. So when you stand at the boardroom level and you yeah. talk to them, you with a very strong credibility can say exactly how things are out there in the real world, which by the way, they're never done. Mm. Um, now on top of that, just to make things even more impossible, I don't have a phone. And I haven't had a phone for two years, not a smartphone, not a regular phone. And, and that has really been a tremendous help for me not to have a phone, I have to say, because people around me, people in, the, in my organizations are used to not being able to get hold of me. Mm -hmm. um, they can, if they will, they would call my client when I'm in the right. road, on the road. Or would, but would, they, would they send you, like, do you walk around? If you don't have a, just to be clear for everyone, so you don't have a phone, but you carry a tablet or nope. a laptop with you? Well, I do. I'm using a laptop now, but I don't take it with me on the road. So uh, when I'm in the field, so I'm in my hotel room right now. But yeah. uh, uh, no, I only have a, a ordinary PC and I use that with the local internet connection. I don't even have a Wi-Fi sort of card you can plug into. It. And, and, and here's the reason why. We become so addicted to using the, the phone everywhere. And as soon as we have, yeah. I mean, one minute of break we will grab it and do something with Ten it, seconds. anything with it yeah. right so we don't get bored and i i want to reflect i want to defragment my brain to see how the world works and put everything into perspective and because yeah. i'm so blessed i mean 
I've been traveling to more than 100 countries and doing work in more than 100 countries. I see so much stuff. And rather than me sitting on a bloody phone all the time, yeah. I learn and I put it into perspective. And guess what? That becomes a new book, but it also becomes quite often a insight which companies are really keen on learning more about. Yeah, I think that's incredibly powerful. I mean, just when, as you were talking about that, my mind just went to how present you must be, you know, in that moment. And I'm, for for so many of us, you're right, we're, we're not present. Our minds are going in all different directions. We're thinking different things. We have all these different yeah. distractions and yeah. we're, we're, we're missing so much of the the opportunity that is, um, you know, right in front of us to, to enjoy that moment. So uh, I appreciate you sharing that and um, just amazing that you've been doing that for two years. So Martin, I want to wrap up with um, talking about your, your book. So by the time that we air this, your new book will have just come out. So tell yeah. us, what is the new book all about? Well, the new book, this is the backstory of the new book. And so one of our clients, um, a major bank, um, called us and said, hey, uh, we want you to figure out how we become more human. Um, and it's one of the largest banks in the world. And we said, hey, that's really interesting. Bank, human, kind of doesn't fit together normally. <laughs> uh, so we began working with them and realized that the bank, because of, of, of compliance, were really heavily um, basically just attacked by compliant left, right, and center. And uh, through that process, um, I worked with a, this young girl, which one day said to me, hey, Martin, I'm, I'm so sick and tired of all this compliant stuff and all these rules and regulations and there's red tape and there's bureaucracy everywhere. Why don't, why don't we invent something called the Ministry of Common Sense, where we reinstall common sense in our organization? Mm. And that became the title of my new book, The Ministry of Common Sense. And the book is really looking at how organizations and, and you and me in our ordinary lives have been completely attacked by a common sense or lack of common sense in everything we do. You know, it happens everywhere. I mean, the other day I was in the airport, in JF Kennedy's airport, and, and uh, I, I bought a pair of headsets. And they were wrapped in this bottle of plastic, heavy, solid plastic and i bought it after security right and and i had to open it and literally the entire department lounge, the departure lounge was involved in opening my headset and of course we all ended up having bleeding hands and the, the headset i'm not kidding was intact perfectly intact right i went through tsa you no know, as you know this is security in the united states mm -hmm. the other day and and, and it, there was a sign saying that people who are 75 years or older do not need to go through screening. So I said to the guy behind security, tell me, these terrorists, do they retire officially at the age of 75? <laughs> and, so where's the common sense? Where's the common sense in offices where our clients quite often tells me that you have to call in for sick leave 48 hours before you turn sick? Right. <laughs> I, I mean, all the, all the technical stuff we waste time on every day. How often haven't you tried to go into a meeting room mm. and you try to set up the projector or you try to dial in on some line where it's the wrong number or whatever. So common sense is completely gone. And really what I decided to do was to write this book to reinstall common sense and to give some concrete tools where you and even mid-sized a lot of companies can immediately restore common sense and make the organization much more productive because common sense today or the lack of it is probably the reason why companies are perhaps 30 or 40 percent slower than they would be because it's all these rules and red tapes which are holding it back and by the way killing ideas killing cultures and killing innovation right so that's the essence of, of the book where did you get all these stories from? I mean, it's, I'm sure on, on your travels and working with clients, there's a whole bunch there, but did, did you collect data around this? Did you do a study? Where, where were you kind of able to capture all of this for the book? We, um, we spent a lot of time on the road for the last four years collecting information and doing interviews with hundreds of our clients. Mm. Um, we went into MERSC. We went through the entire transformation of MERSC, which were 
pretty big job. I mean, it's 88,000 staff across the whole world. And, it, and while I did the job, I was thinking about where's the common sense factory here? And we removed commons, lack of common sense throughout the organization. And we did that in the banks and we did that in basically every major industry you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And out of that, the book became not just, well, here's all the stupidities going on. It actually became real life examples about how you solve it in a super simple way in order to free up and, and, and give people more ox oxygen. So everything is live, everything is real, and everything is, is very practical. So I think when, hopefully when people read it, they will say two things. They'll say, hmm, you're so right. This is exactly my life. And my God, I forgot about how good it actually could be and how dreadful it is. And the second they'll say, my God, that is such a clever solution. I want to implement that straight away. And I do think we'll get to that point. Certainly all my clients, which I've given uh, pre-reads uh, of the book, are saying that is the book we wanted to have five years ago, right? Yeah. Well, uh, for everyone listening and, and watching, I've uh, been reading Martin's books now for 17 years and I've always uh, found them to be a great read. So highly encourage you to go out and, and grab a copy of it. Martin, again, thank you so much for coming on here today. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. And thanks for all your good questions. And I'm still nervous if anyone will hear about my new book, but at least I know I have one reader. That's you. Good stuff.